Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all uh, in the Lord's house uh, this evening. And if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. 1 Chronicles chapter 16 uh, this evening. And uh, tonight I'd like to uh, begin uh, a study that um, I'd like us to continue for a while. Um, and that is the study of systematic theology. Um, this will take quite a while for us to go through, so we'll take uh, frequent breaks from it. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that we ought to uh, study this together. And so if you have your Bibles in First Chronicles 16, I'd like us to start by reading verses 10 through 12. The scripture says, Glory ye in his name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. And now let's go to our Lord together in a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you and we thank you for allowing us to gather to uh, worship together this evening. Oh Lord, we pray that uh, everything that we say and do here would be to your glory. Oh Lord, we ask your blessing as we uh, begin to study the uh, topics of systematic theology. And Lord, we just pray that you would prepare our minds for it. Oh Lord, help me to know how I, ought to, uh, how I ought to speak these things to everyone, how I can make them plain to them. And oh Lord, we just pray that everyone would uh, be edified uh, in, uh, in this study, Lord. Lord, we ask for those who couldn't make it to worship here with us uh, tonight that you'd keep them safe. And Lord, we pray you'd bring them back to us to worship again. Lord, we pray that you would be with our missionaries where they are, that you would help them, uh, give them all the things that they need at our hand. And Lord, we pray that uh, their uh, mission would be uh, prosperous. Lord, be with all of the churches uh, in our state, Kentucky, Lord. Uh, Lord, help them in their uh, difficulties. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would help them even when they've uh, been unfaithful, Lord, to bring them back to uh, the way that you would have them to be. Lord, we ask that you would keep us all safe in the days ahead and that you would help us to serve uh, Jesus Christ in, your, uh, in you, Lord. This in his holy name we pray it. Amen. So tonight, as I said, we're beginning to study systematic theology. And we studied this a little bit um, a while ago, uh, when you first uh, had me to be uh, your pastor, when you uh, first called me to be your pastor, we studied systematic theology together. Um, but even then, it was a fairly limited study that we did in systematic theology. And I'd like to revisit it now, five years later, uh, to really begin to dig into what uh, the scripture says uh, about God and, and the various topics about God. So what is systematic theology first? Well, first, the word, uh, the word theology just means words about God. Uh, theos is Greek for God and logos is Greek for word. So it's just words about God. Uh, and systematic theology means that we're studying God, and we're, we're putting in order words about God. Um, I have a couple of books that I brought up here with me, and I'd like to read uh, a short definition from each of them uh, about systematic theology. This is James Boyce's abstract of systematic theology. And he says, the word theology means literally a discourse concerning God. But in analogy with other words as geology, chronology, and biology, it means the science which treats of God. So just like those other words, like biology and geology, biology means, uh, means the science of living things, of biological things, and geology means the, the, the science of, uh, of the world and the science of uh, specifically the rocks that make up the world. So theology is the science about God. It's, it's talking about God in a systematic way, just like those sciences talk about their subject in a systematic way. Uh, here Cornelius Van Til, in, in Introduction to Systematic Theology, writes on page 
15, he says, systematic theology seeks to offer an ordered presentation of what the Bible teaches about God. So it's taking all that the Bible teaches about God and it's putting it in order for us. It's, it's laying out all that the Bible teaches, all of the doctrines about God in an orderly way so that we see how, uh, how the Lord has revealed himself in all of these different, in all of these different areas. So this is what systematic theology is. And I'd like to spend the rest of our time this evening asking why it is that we should study systematic theology. Why is it that anyone should study systematic theology? And why is it that everybody should study systematic theology? Why every one of us here in this room ought to have some idea of systematic theology? And the first reason is because as Christians, we are commanded to learn about God. In 1 Chronicles 6, Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. It it tells us explicitly that we're to glory in the name of the Lord by seeking after the Lord. By, 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 by looking in to what he's done and who he is. That this is how, this is one way that we as Christians, as how we as human beings bring glory to God is when we study and remember about what God has done and who God is. In Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1 it says, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. He says, remember now your creator. Study now your creator. Learn about him today while the the, the troubles of the future are not upon us. That It's urgent that today we study about God. In Proverbs 9 and verse 10 it says, that the fear of the Lord is, is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So to know God, the knowledge of the holy, the knowledge of God is understanding, and the fear of the Lord is wisdom, well, Proverbs tells us to get those two things, to pursue after wisdom and understanding. Proverbs 4, 5 says, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. So the principal thing is to fear the Lord our God, that is wisdom. And with all thy getting, it tells us to get understanding, to understand the God who we fear, we reverence, and worship. And so we're told to study about God. We're told to learn more about God. But where do we get this the, the, that first word in systematic theology? Where do we get the systematic part in systematic theology? We may ask, isn't it enough to, 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 to simply um, read uh, in, uh, to, 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 to simply have some notions about God? some disordered notions that are not set up in uh, a, uh, an ordered way, in a systematic way. Where do we get that idea that we need to order the doctrines about God that we read about in Scripture in, a, in an orderly fashion, in a reasonable fashion? Well, the reason that we, that where we get this from is first the fact that God has made us reasonable creatures. He's made us to understand things in reasonable ways, in orderly ways. That's how we start understanding anything. Um, if, if, if you want to know uh, about any kind of a topic, um, say you want to know about how, um, how cars work, and most of you probably know more about how cars work than I do. But if you want to, want to start about learning about that, 
you have to start with the basic principles and, and, and with the, the general uh, ideas behind uh, cars, behind engines, behind um, the, the way that power is transferred through, um, through mechanisms. And then you have to work your way to how the whole car works together. And God has made us to begin to understand things that way. We don't begin learning mathematics by studying calculus when, when we're children. We, we begin by studying what are numbers. What, what exactly are numbers? How, how, what is addition? How do we add numbers together? And it's the same thing with theology. We ought to study theology systematically so that we can understand theology. We can begin to comprehend it. In Daniel 2 and verse 20 it says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth this deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. God gives wisdom. Wisdom. God gives knowledge. The, 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 the fact that we can think about things clearly and distinctly and orderly is a gift given to us from God. And if we're supposed to be studying about God in order to glorify him, we should use that mind that God has given us. Whatever mind God, God has given us, whatever capacities we have to understand the scripture, to, uh, to understand theology, we should use it. And what that entails is putting doctrines in order, understanding them in their proper place in the Scripture. Mark 12 and verse 29 likewise says, Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy thy mind and with all thy strength this is the first commandment we're to love god with all of our minds with the, with the mind that god has given us we're to use it in love towards him to study what what he has revealed of himself to us we also have examples in scripture about how it is that doctrines can be set in order uh, not just that we've been made reasonably, we've been made to be able to set these things in order, but the scripture itself gives us examples of doing this. Uh, in Romans 3, verses 9 through 18, if you'd like to turn there, we have a very short systematization of the doctrine of sin and the doctrine of depravity given to us right there. Romans 3 and verse 9, the scripture says, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. And this is what he's going to, to, to show to us systematically now. He's going to prove that all men are under sin by setting in order the doctrine, the, the, the scriptures of, uh, of, of the Bible. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their mouth is, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. All of those are different quotations from the Old Testament, taken from different places in, in the Scripture. They're spread out all over the Old Testament, and yet here the Holy Ghost brings them all together to show us that they're all talking about the same thing that we can learn about this same principle in the scripture from all of these things and that they ought to be set in order. And it, what it's proving again is that all men are sinners. All men are depraved. There is no one that's able to call upon God by their own power. 
And so this is just a short example in the scripture about how the doctrines of scripture need to be set in order, set in their proper place to be understood. Now, another reason why we uh, ought to study theology is so that we can glow, uh, grow closer in our relationship with God. We can grow closer to God simply by studying about him and learning more about him. We can grow closer to him in assurance. We can become more assured of our relationship with God. Um, how can we grow in assurance of our salvation, in assurance of our relationship with God, if we don't know anything about God, if we don't know anything about our Savior? If, if we're not growing in our understanding of God, how are we going to grow in understanding of the salvation that God brings to us? We have to know about God if we, uh, that, that, that God is both willing and able to save us if we're going to learn more about and, and grow more in our assurance. Um, if, if I want to have assurance in you, if I want to have confidence in you, that I can trust you with, with doing something, I have to know about you. I have to know your character. I have to know your ability. I have to know not only would you be willing to, uh, to say, stack chairs, uh, after a after a meal, uh, but I also have to I, not only that you're you're able to do that, but you're willing to do it also. If I'm going to have assurance that you're going to be there to to help me, say stack chairs or something like that. Uh, I, I, in order to have personal assurance in you, I have to have knowledge of you, and it's no different with God. We have to know God and know about God in order to have assurance in Him. And if we grow in our knowledge of him, we grow in our assurance of him also. In 2 Peter 3.17 it says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. He's, he's, he's warning them against falling from their own steadfastness. He's talking about a matter of assurance towards them. And he says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. He says, if, if we would be assured against this, if we would be assured that we will not fall, that we will persevere, he says, learn about God. Grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so get assurance to ourselves. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. He says to learn of him, to learn about him, to learn more about him so that we can find rest to our souls. So, so, that we can, so that we can be more assured in the salvation that he's given to us. So, so, so that we know that we are his and that, and that he will not abandon us. We can also grow closer to God in our character if we'll study theology, if we'll study the scripture systematically. We'll grow in our character. In Hosea 4 and verse 1, the scripture says, Hear the word of the Lord. Ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. He's saying there was no knowledge of God in the land. There was that that, that, that the people had not had an interest in learning God, in, in 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 knowing Him personally, or or just learning about Him. And so, in chapter six of Hosea, in verse six, he says. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. If they had known about God, then they would know what he required of them. They would know that he desired mercy, that he desired that they would not transgress his law. If we study God, if we study theology, we'll know even better 
what it is that the Lord requires of us, and we'll have even more motivation to serve him if we'll study about God. Also, because head knowledge is not everything in the Christian life. Um, well, head knowledge is not everything in the Christian life, rather. I don't want to, to confuse us about that. But again, we can't grow closer to God if we don't know about him. We can't grow closer in our character, in our behavior, if we don't know about him. In Psalm 1 and verse 1 that we sing often, the scripture says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So, so these are all undesirable things that... that, that He says, blessed is the man that does not do these things. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day after. And he's thinking about it. He's ordering it in his mind. he's, He's putting everything in its proper place relationally to know about God. Um, And and, and so this is just, again, to, to study the Bible. Um, seriously, rationally, and put everything in its proper place is necessary for us to avoid these things. To, to, to not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful. Uh, in order to avoid that, we must do the other thing. Meditate on the scripture. In 1 Corinthians fourteen eighteen. It says, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than ye all. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Again, in order to grow in the Lord. In order to be men in understanding, we have to study the scripture. We have to study it as a man studies something, as an adult studies something, systematically, just as God has given us minds to do it. We we also ought to study systematic theology, not just to grow in the Lord, not just to grow in our character and uh, and our assurance of the Lord, but also to be better able to serve God. We ought to study theology. Personally, we ought to study theology to be better teachers wherever we are. In 2 Timothy 2.15 it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We ought to be diligent. We ought to study to rightly divide the word of truth. To be an approved workman, to be able to serve God, we ought to study and rightly divide the scriptures. In Hebrews 5.12 it says, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. He's rebuking this church here, and he's saying, it's time that you were teachers, but you haven't even learned these first things right. You you need to learn the first principles of the oracles of God. So in order to be teachers, to be qualified teachers, we need to be able to study the scripture, to know systematically what it says. In verse 13 it says, of Hebrews 5, it says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them, that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. We need to, we need to, to grow up into Christ, grow up into the knowledge of Christ in order to be teachers. And this is not just teachers in the church either. This isn't just uh, the office of a pastor or the office of a, a lay teacher in the church, but this is anyone who teaches uh, the doctrines of, of the scripture. This is anyone who, who, who teaches children, who has children or grandchildren, and want to teach them about the Lord. We need to be able to, again, know what the Lord has revealed about himself to us. And so we ought to study theology 
to that end. We also ought to study theology so that we can serve God in evangelism as well. And Brother Ronnie taught me uh, an awful lot about this um, going door to door uh, over the years. In 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, the scripture says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. It, it, this is, of course, talking about a mode of evangelism, to give, to give an answer of the gospel to those that ask of us, to be able to bear witness of Christ. But what does he say is a requirement for that? Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. What does that mean? It, of course, it means having a love for God and, and having affection towards him. But it also means serving him with our hearts, serving him with our mind. Just like Psalm 1 said, his, on his law he meditates day and night in order here to give an answer to every man that asks, in order to preach the gospel to them. We need to know what the scripture says and put its doctrines in order to know about them in this way. Also, corporately, we need to know about theology in order to serve him. A whole church needs to, needs to be taught theology and have a theology in order to serve God as a congregation. In 1 Corinthians 3.9 it says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That the foundation of the church is Christ, right? It's, it's, it's Jesus. And he, he tells us to take heed how we build upon that foundation. Well, what is the foundation also in, in the scripture? What, what do we also read about the foundation? In Hebrews 2 and verse 20, it says that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Christ is the cornerstone, and the scripture bears witness to Christ. He's the cornerstone, and he sets the lines for the foundation so that the foundation can be built straight off of him. And then the scripture is given to us to bear witness of Christ. And it says, take heed, in 1 Corinthians 3, take heed how we build upon that foundation. What are we building on that foundation? The church, we're, we're, we're building this congregation on that foundation. But take heed how we build upon it. Take heed how we make use of the scripture. Take heed to set the doctrines in order in the church. To build the church on the pattern of, of theology that the scripture has given to us. And so we have to study theology in order to corporately serve God. And finally, we ought to study theology simply because it's glorifying to God, simply because it brings glory to his name. In Psalm 107 and verse 1, uh, we have a long passage here that, that tells us uh, about glorifying God uh, and, and how it is that God is glorified among his people. It says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them out of their distress. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. In this psalm here, it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say and glorify God for all that he's done. And then it gives us this long discourse about what he's done about how he saved Israel from the land of Egypt and how he spiritually saved us from our sins and how he did that and how he brought us into this place together to worship him, to, to enjoy him. And 
if we don't know who God is, if we don't study what he's done for us and put it in a, in a, in a, in a systematic way, in an ordered way, like we see here in this psalm, then how is it that we can say so? How is it that we can declare that as, as the, the, uh, the passage says that we ought to? How is it that we can say with the psalmist, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Uh, how can we glorify God with our mouths if we don't know about God? We need to study the scripture and study systematic theology so that we can grow in our glorifying of God, grow in our worship towards God. And just a, a, a short note about that passage there. In verse 8, it mentions the wonderful works of God. And that's the title that was given to a work on systematic theology, a popular work on systematic theology that I have in our library, written by uh, Herman Bavink, and it's titled The Wonderful Works of God. And that's what we're studying, the wonderful works of God together. And so, believers, I pray that as we study systematic theology, uh, that the Lord would help us to better glorify him, to better serve him, uh, to better grow in our assurance and our knowledge of him. And I pray that we would all be in prayer uh, about this. And now if there's an unbeliever here uh, this evening, I'd like to read 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 7 to you. 7 and 8. It says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Without the knowledge of God, without knowing him personally, you will suffer an eternity in hell. You, you will suffer under God's wrath if you do not know God savingly. And this is because you've sinned against him. Revelation 21.8 says that the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Because of how good God is, as we'll study later in our, uh, in our topics here, because of how good he is, he cannot abide sin. He must punish sin. He is wrathful forever against sin. And because you have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, there is no escape for you. Without the knowledge of Jesus, without coming to him and trusting on him, you will not be saved. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. You don't need to know systematic theology to be saved. You don't have to study all the topics that we'll be studying to be saved. But you do have to know this one thing, that you have sinned against a holy God. You've sinned against the God of the Bible. And God has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for sinners, to take the punishment of sinners onto himself so that those who trust in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Come to Jesus Christ and learn this of him. Rest on him and you will be saved. And again, believers, I pray that the Lord would help us in our studies in the days ahead. And let's go to our Lord in a word of prayer together. Father God, we come before you again and we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you've revealed yourself to us. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to set in order the things uh, that you've delivered to us. We ask that you would help us this week to serve you, that you would place someone in our path of life to talk to about Christ Jesus. And we ask that they would be saved. Be with those who couldn't make it to worship tonight. And we pray that you would comfort them. Lord, that you would help them to grow in the knowledge of your son Christ where they are. And we pray that you would bring them back to us soon to 
worship together again. Lord, in all things, we pray that we would be glorifying to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.